Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless your name for your word. I will pray that your word will do good in every life today. In Jesus' name, Amen. all we need, all we desire, all you have promised, I pray, Lord, you fulfill in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the pages of the scriptures to us. Help us, Lord, to behold wondrous, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Enlighten us. Encourage us. Edify us. Lift your people up in Jesus' name. And establish everyone according to your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at the word of God. We're coming to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. I'm reading from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, verse 6. Now, the end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart. Out of a good conscience. And of faith, of faith, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, from which some, having put away concerning faith, have made a shipwreck. As you look at those verses we have read, you'll discover, number one, faith. In verse 5, once again, now, the end of the commandment, the goal of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment, the destination, the final point, what you are aiming at is concerning the commandment of God, is charity, is love, out of a pure heart, and a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, faith unpretending, faith not hypocritical, faith not superficial, faith that is real. And so, Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God, is saying, whatever commandment you reach of, in the new covenant, in the new testament, and whatever the preaching, whatever the motivation of the message, it is for this goal, it is for this reason that there will be faith. And as you come to verse 19, it says, holding faith, keeping faith, standing on faith, holding faith, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith and made shipwreck. Once again, he mentions the faith there. Makes us to understand then, as we look at the scriptures and we study the scriptures, we study the scriptures so that we can lead people to faith because without faith, we cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot live with God. Without faith, we cannot fellowship with God. Without faith, we cannot receive from God. You need to check up there from yourself. In your own heart, you hear the word of God. What's the goal? You come to the fellowship. What's the goal? And you receive all these teachings of the word of God. What's the goal? Remember, the goal, the aim the destination and the purpose is faith out of a pure heart. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, compulsorily. Must believe, it's essential. Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, faith in Christ. Without faith, faith in the Savior. 
without faith, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith, faith in God's promise. Faith in God's power. Faith in God's provision. Without that faith in God's faithfulness. Without faith in God's word. We cannot have any relationship with him. And we cannot maintain any relationship with the almighty God. Not having faith in God is making him a liar. How will somebody think about you? That you don't have trust in him. You don't have confidence in him. Your wife or your husband, every time you speak, uh, he says, well, I doubt that. I don't believe that. I don't accept that. I don't trust. I don't think you are transparent. I don't think you mean what you say. I don't think you say what you mean. Relationship will not continue with that individual because you make him a liar. You make him a deceiver every time. Even in a personal relationship, there is the need for trust and confidence and faith. The same thing with God. Every time God speaks, Every time God shows the way, every time Christ reveals that this is the way, walk you therein, you say, I don't believe that. I think there's an alternative. I think you are not saying what you mean. I think you are not meaning what you say. There will be no relationship between you and the Lord because you make him a liar. We're looking at First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, looking at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar. You insult him by not believing him. You reject him by not believing him. You equate him with Satan by not believing him. You make him a liar and Satan is the liar. That's why, as we preach the word of God, knowing that this is fundamental, knowing that this is foundational, knowing that this is the essential, indispensable sin, the end of the commandment is faith out of a pure heart. It will lead you to faith for salvation and faith for holiness. And faith for the mighty grace of God coming into your life. And faith for all the promises of God being yes and amen in your life. Come back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm reading again from verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And of a good conscience. And of faith, of faith. You'll see that side by side with the faith is a good conscience. Come back to verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience. It's saying we hold faith. We have faith. We possess faith. And we keep to that faith and then in a good conscience. Today we're looking at this message, keeping the faith in a good conscience. Keeping the faith in a good conscience. Keeping the faith in a good conscience. There are three things we're talking about. Number one, the function of every person's conscience. The function of every person's conscience. Number two, the formation of a purged conscience the form the formation formation of a purged conscience how do you form how do you enlighten that conscience how do you edify that conscience how do you build up that conscience so that it will be the conscience of a christian the conscience of a person that wants to get to heaven the conscience of a person that is seeking the face of the lord I want to do right every time. Number three, the fruit of a pure conscience. The fruit, the result of a pure conscience. Number one, the function of a person's conscience. 
the function of every person's conscience. We're coming back to you. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. Reading from verse 5 again. Now, the end, the purpose, the reason for, the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, which everybody should have, which every Christian should have, and which even the unbeliever should be careful not to tamper with. But look at verse 6, from which some have been swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Was vain jangling, useless argument. Instead of concentrating on the essentials, instead of concentrating on the non negotiable, instead of concentrating on the things that will be for the good of man, good of society, and also be for our eventual good to get to heaven, they turn aside from faith and a good conscience. And they turn aside unto vain jangling, useless argument, worthless argument. And they look at verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they are firm. We're looking at verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. That is, they appear to have been saved. They were born again, they were saved. But now, they do not understand that even after you are saved, you need to maintain a good conscience. Because that conscience has a great function. What's the function? Let's come back now to Romans again. We read it before, let's read it again. Repetition makes for emphasis. And repetition also instills, inscribes these things in our minds and hearts so that will not forget. In Romans chapter 2 verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. That means on the judgment day nobody can say I didn't know. Yes you knew. I didn't have the reference of the Bible that says thou shalt not steal. It was in your heart. That shall not covet what belongs to neighbor, it was in your heart. That shall not commit adultery, it was in your heart. And thou shalt not kill, it was in your heart. I wrote that in your heart. You see, many people think if you don't have the tables of stone, you don't have the commandment of the Lord. If you do not have a Bible to read, you don't have the law of God. Yes, you do. Look at this in verse 15. Which show the work of the law reaching in their hearts, their conscience, their conscience, their conscience, also be only witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing them. Genesis chapter 6. We're reading from verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. You know what that means? My spirit strives with man, but not always. If a person decides, that's where I'm going to go. The conscience is saying, no. Through the spirit of God, the conscience says, you're not going the right direction. But you, you neglect that. You overlook that. It says, a time will come. When that conscience will be dead, and then the spirit will not strive with that man anymore. For that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. And many people, they think that those in the Genesis period, that they didn't know anything about the law of God. Because Moses had not come. And because Moses had not come, the law had not been given unto them. And so everybody could do whatever they wanted to do. Not really, not really. Look at Genesis chapter 20. In Genesis chapter 20, I'm reading here from verse, uh, from verse 6. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. 
For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. That's Genesis. They knew there was sin because um, Abimelech had taken Abraham's wife. And then God came to him and said, you're a dead man. That woman with you is another man's wife. Genesis. That means uh, it was wrong for them in Genesis to even take another person's wife. And then the man said, I'm righteous. The man told me he is my uh, sister. And then come to verse 7. Genesis. Now therefore, restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live. If thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are dying. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all the things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. Look at this. And Abimelech called Abraham, and said unto him, what hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom? Tell me. A great sin. Genesis. They knew there was sin. Genesis. They knew there was a great sin. But look at the next sentence here. For you to understand, they have the law of God written in their hearts that they should not do evil. It says, Thou hast done deeds unto me. Tell me the rest. That ought not to be done. And that's Genesis. Uh, Genesis is telling us that they had conscience. And their conscience told them this was wrong. You couldn't do that. We're coming to Genesis chapter 37. So I want you to block away from your mind, uh, you know, the idea that all those uh, people at Genesis, uh, at the time of Genesis, after all, they didn't know God and they didn't know the word of God and the law of God had not been given. Because the law of God had not been given, that means they were free. No, they were not free. Their conscience told them. Uh, we're looking at Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Here we're reading from uh, verse Eight and verse 9, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what is not what is with me the house? And he has committed all that he has to my hand. Look at this. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. The latter part of that verse, we're going to read that together. One, two, three, go. In Genesis, look at that. He said, no, you're giving yourself to me. You're offering yourself. I cannot do that. Because if I did that, it would be, number one, great wickedness. Number two, it would be sin against God. How can I then do this great wickedness? And sin against God. So you understand that they were in the period of Genesis did not mean that they had no law. They had the law written on their conscience, on their heart. That's the function of the law. Chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. I'm reading from verse 19. Genesis chapter 42. And here we're reading from verse 19. If you be true man, Joseph talking to his brothers, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And he did so. Look at verse 21, and they said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? That thing had happened many years before. More than 10 years before, they had sold Joseph into slavery. 
and how they came to Egypt. They didn't know they were talking to Joseph. They didn't know that Joseph was still alive. And they, they were talking to one another. And they were saying, we we'll remember our conscience pricking us. Our conscience is reminding us. We did evil because we're very late guilty concerning our brother. And in that, we saw the anguish of his soul. When he besought us, he was crying. He was pleading. We will not hear the cries of Joseph more than 10 years earlier came back to their mind. And we will not hear, therefore, is this distress come upon us? And Reuben answered them, saying, Speak not I unto you, saying, Do not sin. They knew there was sin. In the Old Testament, they knew there was sin at the time of Genesis before Moses ever came. Because God had planted that conscience in everyone. Do not sin against the child, and ye will not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required of us. We're coming to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 7. Here they brought a woman, the religious hypocrites. Here they brought a woman, these Pharisees, these religious people, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And their goal was not to defend righteousness. Their goal was to accuse Jesus of whatever they wanted to accuse him of. In John chapter 8, verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. That's all he said. He didn't say, you're all sinners, you're all hypocrites, you're all pretenders. He didn't say, you're all just religious people and you are not living righteous. I said, all he said is that, you want to stone her? That's all right. The Lord says, whosoever has done this, stone the person. He didn't tell them, you have a log of wood in your eyes and you are looking at the moat in other people's eyes. He didn't say that to them. All he said is, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. Look at this. And again, he stooped down. And wrote on the ground. He wasn't even looking at their faces. He wasn't looking at their eyeballs. He wasn't trying to threaten them. By the way he looked at them, he looked away from them and was right on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted in their own, tell me the word, conscience. That conscience is never one. Religious, irreligious, hypocritical sincere, heavenly minded, hell bent, whoever, the conscience is there. And so as they came to the Lord Jesus, this is the function of the conscience. The function of the conscience to remind us things are not right. To remind us we're not living right. To remind us that action is not okay. To remind us that thing you say is little, negligible. You know you have a wrong purpose. You have a wrong bent of mind. You know that you're doing that and it's a sinful sin. And you might say to people outside, I didn't know, I didn't know, but you know, but you know, because the conscience is there. These were not believers. These were sinners, and yet their conscience convicted them, and they which had it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the elders, the older people have conscience, and then it goes on to say, even unto the last, unto the least, the young people too, they have conscience, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. The point is, there is conscience. And our conscience will either justify us or condemn us. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. The function of the conscience, the person's conscience. A good conscience is to the soul what pain is to the body. 
Think about that. A good conscience is to the soul what pain is to the body. You know, you're, you're just uh, moving on and all that. It appears you have no concern at all in life because everything appears okay all of a sudden you feel pain in a particular place in your body and that pain makes you stop everything it arrests your attention it points to something and that pain is telling you there is danger and then you leave everything and you try to seek for remedy you seek for cure why because the pain will not allow you to rest the pain will not allow you to think about any other thing pain is there i must give attention to my body at this time the same thing with conscience the conscience will prick you the conscience will bring spiritual pain and it will bring emotional pain in your body in your soul in your heart and that pain is saying stop there's something wrong here you cannot continue like this. Like the pain in the body, if you don't attend to that pain, eventually you might die. And the same thing with the pain of the conscience, if you don't attend to that pain, you might die spiritually. That's why the pain in the conscience is very important. Pain arrests our attention and drives us to seek redemption or remedy. When there's no pain, the disease may cause sudden death. And that's why we're here. I saw him yesterday. I saw her yesterday. He was a, he was a healthy man. He was a good-looking man. And he was, a, you know, in good form. How is he that he just died today? They say it's a sudden. Well, uh, maybe there has been pain that the fellow said, I can manage that. I can go along with that. I can endure that. I can live my life without that because I'm a man of action. And I want to keep on in action. I won't allow any pain to stop me. Maybe it's better to stop and give attention to that pain. The same thing in the conscience. You know, the conscience is uh, shouting loud. That's not right. It's a function of the conscience. The conscience is saying, stop that activity. Stop that action. And stop that movement. Because there is something urgent, important, imperative you need to handle. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ, whom ye crucified. They crucified him, and they didn't even think about that anymore. They crucified him and they said, let his blood be upon us. They crucified him and they went back home to eat. They crucified him and they looked at him and said, if you are the Christ, come down from the cross. They crucified him and then after his resurrection, they said, you tell the leaders that his disciples came and stole his body away. But the conscience was still there. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they knew when they heard this, they were preached in their heart. That's the conscience right there. They weren't believers. They were sinners. They had done evil. And they didn't think about the evil anymore. But when they heard, when they heard this, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The pain in the conscience drives you to seeking solution. And seeking remedy just like the pain in the body and uh, it's dangerous if we don't seek remedy or seek redemption there are people that will just silence the conscience the people that will stifle the conscience the people that will sear the conscience look at first timothy chapter 4 Verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. The nearer you get to God, the more he makes your conscience active, clear, clean, helping, speaking, guiding, and directing, and telling you that's not right, that's not okay. That will not help you. That will not get you to heaven. 
that will bring in uh, satanic power against your life. The more you get near to God, the more the Lord himself will make sure that your conscience is in good form, is in good shape. The farther you go away from the Lord, and the nearer you get to Satan, the more he will deaden the conscience, neutralize the conscience. He will silence the conscience until it becomes sin. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 and verse 2. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. You see that? Depart from the faith. They were in the faith before. There are people that will erroneously tell you that once you are saved, you are forever saved. Once in the faith, you are forever in the faith. Here it says, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, somebody professes to be born again. And from the outward manifestation, the person appears to be born again. But you bring the truth of the word of God and the fellow, he can see, he can read, he can tell from all the references you read from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he knows you are sincere. It is not that you are telling him to leave any scene or to leave any organization or assembly. And you are telling him to come to your church. You are just telling him this is the way to heaven. That's all you are telling him. And he professes to be born again and he keeps on arguing. You see, my brother, look at this. This is plain. This is clear. Deep and I did not try the Bible. I did not try the Bible. I'm reading to you the unchanging word of God. And this is the truth. And the Lord said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. And yet he argues against the truth. Who is the influence in his life? Is he God influencing him to argue against the truth? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, helping him, strengthening him to argue against the truth? Is it the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, that is instigating him, that is pushing him to argue against the truth? No, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Look at verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their conscience, tell me, seared with a hot iron. And what that means is, you know, they, they used to branch animals in those days. Maybe they still do that today. They'll take a hot iron, very hot, and then they mark the skin of that animal. That place that is marked with that hot iron there'll be no feeling there. The feeling is totally gone. And he's talking about the conscience like that, that the conscience that is seared with a hot iron, there'll be no feeling. They do what is wrong, they don't feel. They go the wrong way, they don't feel. Very dangerous because it's the work of Satan. You say, does that happen? And then that person now will believe a lie. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 10. And with all deceivable of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love for the truth, that they might be saved, that they might be finally saved, eventually saved, eternally saved. You see, there is salvation now, initial salvation. The salvation now, experiential salvation. The salvation now, salvation from sin, salvation on earth. But there is final salvation. And the Lord is not just going to look at, I raised up my hand, I got saved. I confessed my sins, I got saved. I was baptized in water, I got saved. And I accepted Jesus as my personal savior, I got saved. That's initial salvation. Now there's final salvation. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But this fellow, I'm saved. He doesn't have the love for the truth. He doesn't have desire for the truth. Are you bringing doctrine? Please hold that yourself. 
Are you bringing teaching? Hold that yourself. I say I'm born. I say I'm a child of God. Are you bringing uh, uh, the teaching of the Word of God? Bringing Bible? Uh uh. You are going to spoil our fellowship. Are you going to spoil everything? It doesn't have love for the truth that you might be saved for this cause. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they tell me the next word tell me out loud are you there verse 12 that they tell me the next word that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in our righteousness and so it's very important that we have this conscience the conscience that is touched by the word. The conscience that feels with the word. We're looking at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 4. There are people, their consciences are dead. Their consciences are seared like with a hot iron. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19. Who being past feeling. Who being past feeling. Uh, you see somebody that is doing something shameful. Something degrading. Something unthinkable. Something inhuman. And they don't feel any guilt. They don't feel any emotion. They don't feel any condemnation. And they, they can do whatever they want to do. Like the brothers of Joseph. They sold their brother to slavery. And after that, they killed an animal and then they cooked and they started eating. That their brother had been sold to slavery meant nothing to them. And their actions showed that they had silenced their consciences. Although that conscience, uh, you know, rose up again, resurrected later and accused them who be in past feeling of giving themselves over Unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But it's tempting to believers in verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. These people look at Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Those um, whose conscience is dead. The conscience is no more active. And the conscience will not respond to the word of God. The conscience will not respond to anything the spirit of God is saying. Understand? The spirit of God is not going to continue forever striving with such people. My spirit shall not always strive with man. For he also is flesh. It's not that if he counts himself unimportant. He counts himself insignificant. He counts himself not worthy of my conviction. I leave him alone. Look at uh, Micah chapter 7. I was looking at verse 3. Micah chapter 7 verse 3. The people who have lost their conscience. The people who have deadened their conscience. The people whose conscience is seared. Look at what they do. That they may do evil. How? And they may do evil with both hands. And how do they do that? Earnestly. Earnestly. Like we are earnestly defending the truth. They are earnestly defending Satan. Earnestly doing evil. Earnestly being violent. They do it with determination. They do it with diligence. They do it on purpose. And they do it seriously. They do it as if... Here is the sin they are created for. Here is the sin they must do. If they don't do this evil, who else will do that evil? And they put all their heart, all their mind into that evil. Because their conscience is gone. They do not understand without holiness no man shall see the Lord. It says that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire. So, they wrap it up. So, they wrap it up. They say, I gave it to him. Go, line and sinker. I told him that lie, and he couldn't understand, and he couldn't decipher. He couldn't, you know, unravel that. They wrap it up. 
Because, and they rejoice in that. And that's telling us that we have to be very careful. We have to be very conscious of the very fact that those who stifle their consciences, there are those who silence their consciences, there are those whose consciences are seared. I pray you'll not be like that in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for a good amen over there. Amen. Point number two now, the formation of a purged conscience. The formation of a purged conscience. We need the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. We need the help of the Lord that our conscience will be brought back to the original state. Why that? Because as we grow up in life, first of all, the conscience will be tender. The conscience will be sensitive. The conscience will be edifying and directing. And the conscience will be pointing us in the right direction. But as you mix with other people, you see what other people do, then you begin to tell yourself, are you not a coward? Other people are bold. Are you not like chicken? Other people are aggressive. Are you not timid? Other people, they do these things and they get all of that. Are you not enslaving yourself? Because I will not, I will not. Everybody is doing that. They're going to run you down. And they're going to walk all over you. So as we grow up in life, our conscience becomes little by little educated in the wrong direction. And so as we now get born again, if we do not bring that conscience to the Lord to be purged and to be purified, we'll discover that although we say we are born again and there are some things that are very clear, like not stealing, uh, you know, from not being a robber, not going to the bank and uh, robbing. And there are some things that look very clear. No, I will not commit adultery. I will not commit fornication. Those ones are very clear, black and white. There are some gray areas that this is not right. But if you are not educated and edified and enlightened in your mind, in your heart, you'll be doing those things and then people say, but you say you are born again. Yes, I'm born again. Does that mean I should be timid? Because when we were in school, they told us, if they give it to you, give it back to them. If they throw something at you, throw it back to them. Otherwise, life will treat you as a slave and you still carry on with that. That's why we come to the Lord so that the Lord will purge our conscience. We're coming to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, it tells us how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, what follows there? Purge your conscience. You see that? The blood of Jesus is not just that, you know, there are people, I'm saved, I'm saved. Hold on. You need more. That's your conscience. Because that conscience, that's the monitor. That conscience, that's the educator. That conscience, that's the one that will guide. It's a guide. That conscience, that's the teacher within you. That should be attached to the Holy Ghost, to the Holy Spirit. And that conscience is not in the right relationship. It's not in the right form. It's not in the right state at present. But you come to the Lord that the blood of Jesus will purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Conscience purged. It will purge our conscience. Look at chapter 10 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 19. It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We draw near unto the Lord because the evil conscience that we've been carrying about, the conscience that has become deaf, dead, dumb, blind, 
We need to carry it back to the Lord. And then there will be a revival. There will be a resuscitation. And a resurrection. A renewal. That it will cleanse us from that evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. As we talk about the conscience, the conscience is like the eye of the soul. It's the one that sees. It sees the action. It's the one that sees. It sees the inner action. The inner action is when you ought to talk, you're not talking. When you ought to say something, you're not saying it. And your conscience is, is saying you're leaving something undone. You're not saying the right thing. And you're afraid of those people. And inside you, you say, you have to talk now. Why are you not talking? Why are you not asking the question? And why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? When there's inaction, your conscience will talk and talk to you. And when there's action, whether good or bad, your conscience will talk to you. Because the conscience is the eye of the soul. If the eye is dim. The conscience will not speak very well. If the eye is darkened, the conscience will not understand. If the eye is closed, then you cannot see anything. If the eye is blindfolded, then the conscience cannot react. If the eyes are destroyed, or the eyes are set by reason of age. By reason of age. Because you are getting older, and because you are old now, what you used to talk about, you cannot talk about that anymore. It's like the bones are weak, the joints are weak, not too bad yet. And like, uh, you know, the strength is no more there, not too bad yet. But now the conscience has also got the same kind of old age disability as the body has got because now the eyes of the soul, they are set. And the eyes even become evil. Look at them one by one. We're looking at the dim conscience. The dim eye. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're reading from verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious, was cursed. In those days, there was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. His eyes began to wax dim that he could not see in the physical the eyes were dim, but in the spiritual, the conscience also had that dim eyesight. When he even heard about his children, he called the children, how is it I'm hearing all this about you? Nay, it is not so. If you fall into the judgment of God, what will happen? But you couldn't take the right action against those children because their eyes were now Deep. Sometimes the eye is darkened, the conscience darkened, that it cannot see right and cannot talk right and cannot defend the word of God right. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, and I'm reading here from verse four. It says. In verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Blinded the minds of them which believe not. There are people who are like that. Their minds are blinded. Their conscience is blinded. And so they cannot really believe what they ought to believe. Other people, they just close the eyes of their mind, the eyes of their conscience. That the conscience does not see. Because deliberately they close their own eyes. Acts of the Apostles chapter 28 and verse 27. Acts chapter 28 verse 27. For the heart of these people is waxed gross. And their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed. They did that on themselves. By themselves. Deliberately. No, I don't want to see holiness. I don't want to see 
Salvation through Christ, I don't want to see. Only Christ can save. I don't want to hear that. And they close their own eyes. And in verse 27, and their eyes are they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and shall be converted and I shall heal them. There are those whose eyes have been blindfolded by the things that happen. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, Deuteronomy chapter 16, reading from verse 19, it says, Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for a gift does blind the eyes of the wise. You know, it's not talking of physical eyes here, it's talking about the eyes of the mind, eyes of the conscience, eyes of the earth. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. If you are receiving uh, some material things from people and you are not asking, where did the money come from? They are giving large, large offering, millions and millions, and you are not asking, what, what work are you doing that you're able to get all this? And then, you know, he writes his name and writes on the envelope, give it to Pastor so and so, give this to, you know, Evangelist so and so. And all the time giving you this and giving you that. Eventually, when something goes wrong with that individual, you cannot talk. It's your benefactor. You cannot talk. It's the one that's always shoveling things to you and giving things to you. And those gifts and those bribes will blind your eyes, the eyes of your conscience. That's how conscience is a dead end. That's why you need to bring that conscience to Christ. And then he revives that conscience. He resurrects that conscience. He purges that conscience. And then all other people, the eyes are just searched. It's like, you know, the anxiety. And what has happened to them is that they said something right, and then people opposed them. They did something right, and people persecuted them. And they did something good, and people opposed them. And said, we don't want that kind of goodness over here. The goodness that will not allow us to steal, that will not allow us to embezzle, that will not allow us to, uh, you know, do this and that. In this economy, who can be living a righteous life? If you stand in our way, we're going to show you that you will not have rest in this place. And eventually, all those things will make you to grow old. Earlier than your age of getting old. And I, if something is happening, you remember, ah, uh, when I spoke at that time, this is what I suffered. You remember, when I tried to stand for righteousness at that time, this is what I suffered. And then your eyes are set. And you cannot oppose evil anymore. The eyes of the conscience become set. We're looking at First Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14, and here we're reading from verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 14, reading from verse 4. Look at this, it tells us, And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, tell me. For his eyes were set by reason of age. But thank God for Ahijah. And thank God for you there. I said thank God for us all. Because even though he didn't have a bright eyesight, spiritually, the eyes of the soul, the eyes of the spirit, the eyes of his heart, spiritually was wide open. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, I pray the Lord will speak to you. Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, and for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in, she shall fain pretend herself to be another woman. Verse 6, and it was so. When a hijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? 
For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. He sent eyes, even though the physical eyes were set, yet he could still see. Why? Because the conscience was purged. The heart was purged. And the heart and the spirit in the right direction. The conscience is the eye of the mind. It must be open. It must be cleansed. It must be healed. It must be purged. It must be enlightened. It must be transformed. That's what the Lord is saying. Come unto him. If you come to him, he will cleanse that eye of the conscience. He will purge that eye of the conscience. You'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Revelation, Revelation chapter 3 verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And why trim it that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Look at this. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. A purged conscience grants us clear sight, spiritual eyesight, the mind of Christ. A, a purged conscience gives us a 2020 vision, a scriptural perception, and God's law reaching on our heart. Sound, truthful, guiding conscience. I pray He will do that in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three now the fruit. Of a pure conscience, the fruit of a pure conscience. We're coming to First Timothy chapter one, verse five and verse nineteen. First Timothy chapter one, verse five. Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. What's the fruit? If the conscience is clear, if the conscience is good, if the conscience is pure, it gives us stability and faith and trust in the Lord. We read the word of God and we take it as face value. We look at the promises, take that at face value. And we look at the precepts, the commandments of God, you take it at face value. You look at the warnings, you take everything at face value because your conscience is responding. Because you have a good eyesight in the sight of the Lord, not only that, as you read the word of God, you are not changing anything, you are not modifying anything, you are not trying to doctor it or tailor it to your weakness. You say, that's the word. If the word condemns you, you say, well, I'm the one that is wrong. And therefore you go to Calvary and your conscience is saying you must pray until things change. That's the fruit of a good conscience. It says a good conscience and faith and faith. We're looking at verse 19. In verse 19, holding faith, not giving up. Holding faith, keeping it. Holding it tenaciously, holding it fast, that you do not play with it or gamble with your soul. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made a shipwreck. What's the fruit of a good conscience? You will not make shipwreck of your faith. You stand. You stand in the will, in the word of God. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, verse 1. Acts chapter 23, verse 1. Oh, and Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I've lived in all good conscience until this day. It was saying, I met the Lord. He convicted me of my sin, of my blasphemy, of my wickedness, of my evil. I asked him, Lord, what will you have me to do? I want to do the right thing now. And then it was revealed to me. And now I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My sins are forgiven. He has set me free. He changed my life. He saved me. And since that time now, I live in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, and as commanded, them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then Paul said unto him, understand now, the Ananas, he was a high priest, but he was just the head of religion. And Paul, the apostle, an apostle, the greatest of the apostles, 
a saint of God, a servant of God, a child of God. And he knew the word of God. He knew that if you're going to judge me, you must judge me according to the law. And so Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, that whited wall. For thou seetest to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? What's a good conscience? You did something you shouldn't have done. You did something, you did it ignorantly. You didn't know that that thing was wrong. And somebody now comes to tell you, it says, you're an apostle, you're a pastor, you are a brother, you're a sister. Why did you say that? Why did you do that? They said, are you reviling God's high, high priest? Good conscience. What's the response of the good conscience? Then said Paul, I wish not, I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written. He was quoting the word of God against himself now. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. And so you understand that when we have good conscience, we correct whatever we have done that is wrong. We do not continue in the evil that will deaden your conscience, that will silence your conscience, that will sear your conscience. And I pray God will help us to preserve this pure conscience in Jesus' name. We're looking in at Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Herein do I exercise myself. It says, I do this every day. I do this every day. I check myself. I evaluate myself. I examine myself over and over. Is my conscience all right towards my wife? My husband, my parents, my children, the church, the leadership, to the word of God. It says, I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. And if I discover I've done something I shouldn't have done, ignorantly, innocently, I quickly go back and make amends because the conscience is very important. In Second Corinthians Chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the conscience, a pure conscience, and the fruit of that pure conscience. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, for our rejoicing is this. And the testimony of our conscience is telling us that when we do right and the conscience says, that's all right, that's the life of a saved soul. That's the life of a sanctified person. That's the life of a person, of a pilgrim going to heaven. That causes us joy because the conscience is giving us approval. Saying, that's right, that's good, that's righteous, that's scriptural. It says in that verse 12, for our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly towards you. It says in the world, when you're not there, the way we react, the way we behave to the people, we behave according to the word of God. And we live according to the word of God. And the fruit is, it gives us joy. It gives us joy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. And then he goes on, not walking in craftiness. It says, we're sincere, we're transparent, we're righteous, we're pure, we're holy. Because we're saved, there's the evidence. And our conscience is bearing witness. And because we're sanctified and our conscience is bearing witness, we're not doing anything that our heart will condemn us about. Just go about preaching and just go about healing the sick and just go about manifesting this and that while our conscience is all the time weeping us and pricking us and, and knocking us. It says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation 
of the truth, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It says we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. First Timothy chapter 3, we're reading from verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest they fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, but the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not giving to much wine, not greedy or filthy looker, holding the mystery of faith. How? In a pure conscience. A pure conscience is a good conscience. A clear conscience is an awakened conscience, a truthful conscience, enlightened conscience, honest conscience is a reliable conscience, unimpaired, transformed, purified conscience is a great, indispensable possession. We learn from God's word and we retain a helpful, a defined, approving, and disapproving, destiny changing conscience. We keep that pure heart, retain a pure conscience, and will walk steadily towards heaven. And I pray on that final day, conscience pure, life pure, heart pure, we will not miss heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, reading from verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend? into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. What does clear hands mean? You understand? You're saved. You're not stealing. You understand? Your hand is not holding bribes. You're saved, and your hands are not touching things that will bring evil, corruption into your life. He has clean hands, and has a pure heart, pure spirit, pure soul, pure conscience, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. The Lord is uh, talking to some people. Thank God we're his people. I says, thank God we're his people. And he speaks to us. And he says, we should come back to Calvary. And have our hearts cleansed and purged, purified. And then our conscience too will be pure in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in their spirit. Pure in their soul, pure in their conscience. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You will see God. Amen. Here on earth, when we pray, we'll see God. Amen. As we live and we're in any danger, we'll see God. Is sure, because you're pure in heart, you're pure in conscience. And then finally, when we get to the great beyond, we'll see God in heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord... Here we are. Here I am. Here I am. I understand. I must have a good conscience, a pure conscience, a purified conscience, a conscience that is functional, not a dead conscience, not a seared conscience, not a silenced conscience, not a conscience of the eye closed, dim, blind, dead, deaf, that cannot see. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. We need faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seek him. That's how we get saved. Seek him. That's how we get sanctified. Seek him. That's how he purges our conscience. From dead works. Seek him. And let your conscience come alive again. Activated. Renewed. 
sensitive. So you are not deaf to the voice of God. Nor blind to the light of the gospel. 